Aotearoa, or Land of the Long White Cloud. New Zealand remained unsettled for many thousands of years. The first people to come here at the end of the 12th century were the ancestors of the Maori. 500 years later, New Zealand was sighted again, this time by Europeans. First Abel Tasman and later James Cook. Two discoveries, two migrations, two destinies. Separate ancestors who explored a faraway land and had to learn to live together. Conflicting sources claim that Columbus was buried in various different cities. It's a very similar story when it comes to Captain James Cook. There are constant arguments about the exact place where he first landed, but the inscription on this monument confidently states that his first landing in New Zealand was right here, near Gisborne City. In fact, James Cook had set out in search of a south continent which according to scientists of the time had to be situated near the Antarctic. New Zealand was a chance discovery along the way. Here in Gisborne, on the shore of the bay stands one more monument to a cabin boy, the first person to sight this land and the people on the shore, the Maori. There are two sides to every coin. Civilization reached New Zealand with James Cook, but it also brought the Maori many sorrows and troubles. James Cook didn't only leave traces in Gisborne. Right on this fairway is Queen Charlotte's Sound, a fjord, and the easternmost of the Marlborough Sounds. At almost 60 kilometers, it's also the biggest in New Zealand. an hour of sailing and now finally a quiet bay. It was to here that strong winds carried James Cook's ship in 1770. When Captain Cook came in here there's quite a few things that were very attractive to him. Now um, first of all there was calm waters so these waters were nice and calm compared to the rough of the Cook Strait and also as he approached the uh, the bay, you have this here. Now this is the freshwater stream and this runs all year round. Now so this is beautiful, clean, pristine water. Okay, so you could, um, uh, his men could drink this, they could use it for washing, bathing, cleaning their equipment. Um, so it was a very, very important source to have. Bay, we can see a small island where there was once a Maori fortress called Pa. During his time here in 1770, uh, he brought the Endeavour over, anchored up, and then they kept, would have come in smaller boats ashore uh, with the local Maori tribe because he'd gotten the permission of the local chief to claim the lands. So uh, here on Motuala Island, 
that's this is where it all happened. This is the the, mm -hmm. the beginning of European uh, official history, so to speak. With the Maori chief's permission, James Cook climbed to the very top of the island. Many tourists have followed in his footsteps along this path, which now leads to an observation tower. The views from the tower are simply amazing. To the north, James Cook saw a sliver of land and assumed that New Zealand consisted of two islands separated by a strait that would later bear his name. This island was to stage the scene where he claimed New Zealand for British rule under King George III in 1770. Um, so, being blown in by accident, but end up being a, a very important area and uh, time, time of his life and European history. James Cook wasn't the first Westerner here. Another explorer, Abel Tasman, gave New Zealand its name after Zeeland, a province in Holland. Abel Tasman was a famous sailor who worked for the Dutch East India Company and sailed the Southern Seas. He was the first to see Tasman Island, not far from Australia, the coast of Australia itself and New Zealand. That was in 1642. However, that meeting didn't go well. When Tasman's ships approached the shore, islanders in boats greeted them with threatening shots. The following day, Maori warriors calmly sailed up to the ship and attacked the sailors, killing three and badly wounding one. Tasman never stepped ashore. Skirmishes with the Maori didn't deter pioneering explorers. Other sailors went to New Zealand after Tasman and Cook, followed by settlers. The colonization of New Zealand had begun. Time appears to have stood still in this village not far from Auckland. George Grey, the governor of New Zealand, was concerned about skirmishes with the Maori and wrote to the Queen with a request to dispatch soldiers who could defend Auckland. On that basis, Queen Victoria just so happened to have some men that had done over 20 years fighting in Afghanistan and Khyber Pass. They had come back retired, worn out, and surplus to requirement. Queen Victoria asked if they would like to form another army called the Royal New Zealand Fencible Corps, meaning to defend. They were allowed to bring their wives and families, and they were asked if they would come to New Zealand as soon as possible. Because back in England the poorest faced nothing but poverty, many accepted the Queen's invitation. In the end, nearly 2,500 people moved from England and Ireland to Howick. The first of them endured particularly hard times. The government failed to prepare properly for the settlers' arrival. At first, they had to live in army-style tents like this. Look at this unpretentious, if not downright miserable home. A portable bed, a chest and a bucket, that's all. Truly austere conditions. Village infrastructure was as simple as it can be. A small shop, a church and a school. We're in a New Zealand school circa 1850. There's also a world map. The British Empire's territory is shown in red, already the colour of New Zealand. 
For some time, the British Empire covered a full quarter of the known world, a huge area. Pubs were plentiful in this village. Places where men could meet over a glass of beer and gamble. In fact, the wives used to get so mad that the pubs were all in a line. At the very end was the paymaster's cottage. And the woman would make sure they would go to the paymaster and get their husband's wages before they spent it all at the pubs going towards the village and the paymaster's cottage. Otherwise, all the money would be drink. Everyone in Akaroa knows this couple. Every day, Annette and Stephen don French clothing and greet with a French flag every ship that comes into port. Does it make you feel different when you wear this costume? Uh, yes, it does change. Um, your mind slows down, you stop thinking about all the things that are 21st century and you try to imagine what it was like for a woman um, of that time to arrive here in Akaroa in this kind of costume. History itself gave the couple the idea for this performance. As well as British settlers, French people also came to New Zealand. Their large colony was established here, in Akaroa. One of Stephen's ancestors was also French. Well, uh, when I went there, of course, I wasn't married. It was um, straight after I'd uh, trained as a teacher. And so I didn't go to some of the places, of course, where Stephen's family came from. Um, but I, I loved Paris, I loved Versailles. Um, his great-great-grandfather actually drove the mail coach from Paris to Versailles as one of his jobs before he became a whaler. Akaroa is a port, a trading town, and the first trade practiced here was whaling. These were whaling pots in which they boiled up the chunks of whale flesh, they extracted the oil, and if you come round over here, they actually poured it out along here, poured it into barrels. The barrels were then loaded onto ships, uh, small ships not much bigger than this, and then out to the mothership. Many French people came to New Zealand. One of them was Baron de Thierry. In the early 19th century, he declared himself king of these lands. The Frenchman had learned of New Zealand in 1821 from the Maori leader Hongi Hika, who was invited to speak in Cambridge. Inspired, he bought a plot of land from the leader, and on that basis alone, named himself king. In 1835, Thierry travelled to New Zealand with his family. But the Maori just laughed and gave him the rather insulting title, King Without Land. The French really did dream of expanding their possessions with New Zealand, but they arrived too late. Great Britain had been first to lay claim to this territory, but faced strong resistance. The Maori were unwilling to give their motherland to colonizers. Wars are an integral part of human history. 
Here, the National Army Museum has a great collection of muskets that belonged to the first colonists. At first, the Maori took white people to be gods who could control fire. Then they themselves learned how to shoot and started destroying each other intensively. The ensuing intertribal warfare went down in history as the musket wars. What happens now is that a lot of tribes from the central North Island or the, the lower North Island can't go back more than three or four or five generations because that was the point where their uh, contact with their home marae was, uh, was stopped basically because of the uh, musket wars. The astute leader of the Ngapuhi tribe particularly distinguished himself in the musket wars. In 1820, he went to England and was met by King George IV, who gave him many gifts. On his way back, the leader sold them all, bought muskets, and conquered all neighboring tribes. By selling weapons to the Maori, Europeans did themselves more harm than good. Those weapons would soon be turned against them. The Maori saw the settlers as conquerors and defended their own land. The Maori built pa and or what they call pa or stockades, uh, a lot of fortifies, uh, fortifications. And, and trenches and were able to shoot, drop back down into the trench, reload, come back up and shoot again. Uh, the British had never seen this type of warfare before and found that uh, it was a very effective defensive tactic. The Maoris struggled bravely, but the Europeans wouldn't budge. Both sides could see that war alone would solve very little and took the first, the most important steps towards each other. This little house in Waitangi district played a huge role in New Zealand's history. Right here, a peace and friendship treaty was signed between Maori tribal leaders and the British Crown. One of the Accord's main authors was an officer called William Hobson. William Hobson and his aides wrote that epoch-making treaty in just four days. Then it had to be translated into the Maori language. A local priest, Henry Williams, took that job on. For five hours, the two sides discussed the treaty and finally put their signatures to it. That historic event was on February the 6th, 1840. The treaty itself is also kept here, in the Waitangi Museum. We know that the English and Maori texts are different. The English version states that the Maori cede their power and land to the British Empire, which they will also obey, just like the settlers. But Father Henry was well experienced in communicating with the Maori, and he knew they'd never agree to such terms. So therefore, when Reverend Henry Williams translated the document into the native tongue, he reworded it by simply saying that Māori would retain all of our rights, our sovereignty over our land and ownership over all of our lands um, and waterways and properties, but we would give first rights uh, to purchase any lands that Māori wished to sell uh, to the British Crown. 
the Maori don't blame Father Henry. He genuinely wanted the sides to reach an understanding. But the translation inaccuracies devalued this very important treaty and sowed the seeds of mutual misunderstanding. Tai Ahu is a lawyer who lives in Wellington and works for a big company. We asked him to evaluate the Treaty of Waitangi in terms of modern jurisprudence. It turns out that the document was littered with failings. It's very clear to me that the, a, a number of the discrepancies must have been intended, I think. I think we can't get escape that. Because Māori would not have signed a treaty that said you will give away your lawmaking authority to the Crown. At first, the British settlers adhered to the conditions of the treaty, but before long were hounding the Maori out of their lands. Finally, by the late 19th century, the Maori had lost most of their territory, and only now are they starting to take it back. Um, I work at a commercial law firm in Wellington here in New Zealand, um, but I work in a team that focuses specifically on Maori rights on Māori regaining and restoring their social and economic position in New Zealand. So all of the historical grievances that Māori have combated and faced uh, previously, the Crown sets up a process by which the, um, th those grievances can be in some way redressed. There were many grudges, and not just about land. The Maori didn't feel that the settlers afforded their culture the respect it deserved. And when they came here, they clearly believed that they were the majority and that my people, the native communities of Aotearoa, New Zealand, were the minorities. And so these brash sailors started coming in and mistreating, once again, the native communities by murdering our children, by raping our women and uh, pillaging our villages. Aggression begets aggression. When the Maori were certain that the treaty had been broken, the Great Northern Wars broke out in the country. Russell was the first city in New Zealand. Now, only tourists invade, but it was once whalemen who reigned supreme. They needed to rest after their time at sea, and so the city enjoyed an active nightlife. Casinos, bawdy houses, and bars. This hill is one of the main points of interest in Russell. They barely settled in the city when the English placed a flagpole on the hill and flew the British flag. But the Maori didn't like it. In 1844, the Maori leader, Hongi Hika, suggested that the British people remove the flag. When they refused, he cut the flagpole down. A bloody war ensued between the English and the Maori. It continued for two years and is recorded in history as the War of the Flagpole. You see, Māori already had a flag um, which represented our country, which represented who we were as a people. And Māori were aggrieved at the fact that Britain would fly their flag and not the nation's flag upon their flagstaff. The War of the Flagpole was the first, but by no means only conflict. Armed clashes shook New Zealand for more than a decade. In 1863, one of the bloodiest battles in New Zealand's history raged on this hill. Everything began with the land. 
The Waikato River Valley is famous for its plentiful lands. Fat cats from Auckland had their eyes on it from the start, but didn't know how to take possession. New Zealand's governor, George Grey, found a solution. Told a white lie. It informed uh, uh, the crown of the time that, that Waikato and the Kinitana was intending on invading Auckland. That gave rise to a statutory right to invade. In June 1863, the British authorities issued a declaration calling on the Maori to take an oath of allegiance to Queen Victoria and to retire behind the Mangataferi River. Then they literally wiped Rangariri Fortress off the face of the earth. As a result of that, we had 1.2 million acres confiscated from us. Uh, there were around 40 people that were killed. There was around 180 so people that were incarcerated. There's a cemetery not far from Rangariri Hill that was established in November 1863 as a result of that battle. Bread shows us the graves of British soldiers, all normal and quite ordinary, complete with headstones. Then he leads us to a small hill on the corner of the cemetery, where, in a nameless mass grave, the fallen Maori are buried. So when you drive past here every day, you recognise the cemetery, you see a complete inequality. One single mound and individual graves. So these are the people that died up there, thrown in a hole, and these are all the soldiers that were on it. Brad is always a restrained gentleman, but here in the cemetery, he can't keep his emotions in check. Not only was the land taken from his ancestors, but also their names. That pain is hard to forget, and it still upsets many Maori. It would be a mistake to completely demonize colonization. On the one hand, war with the settlers brought much sorrow to the Maori. But it was that very colonization that marked the start of Maori tribal consolidation. After the signing of the Treaty of Waitangi, a number of our ancestors travelled afar to Britain, uh, saw how the, uh, the royal infrastructure uh, existed, how it operated, um, and brought that idea back into New Zealand. How things have moved on. This shows a traditional Maori carving, decorating a Waikato tribe sacral house. The central column features the whole genealogy of Maori kings. At the very top is the first king, Patoatao Teferafera. He was very old and declined the role three times. The response was, uh, while your sun may set, there is another day tomorrow, a new day. Meaning that you, because you have uh, descendants, uh, you could be succeeded to. So, uh, in 1858, we accepted. Potato accepted to be king. This small town on the shore of the Waikato River is the unofficial capital of New Zealand. This is the site of the palace of the Maori King. The monarch has no political authority. He's more of a symbolic figure. But the Maori afford him great respect. 
He is our leader. He makes decisions, economic decisions, political decisions, social decisions. He leads in all of those spaces. These are his forums. The Maori might have a right to resent the British Queen, but when the time came, all past grudges were forgotten and they fought for her on equal terms with the British people. The small city of Rifton is a long way from the beaten tourist tracks. But at this time, visitors come here too, for an annual and triumphant parade in honor of the famous 28th Maori Battalion. On the 23rd of January, 1946, 28 Maori Battalion, as a fighting unit, returned from the, uh, the battlegrounds and they arrived back here in, uh, in New Zealand. So we remember that day that they returned and uh, this is what the, ce uh, the uh, celebration and the Remembrance Day is uh, about here today in Reefton. 23rd of January 1946, 28 Māori Battalion returned from the battlegrounds to New Zealand. The British Empire was constantly at war on different continents and the New Zealanders played their part as subjects of the British Crown. On the Maori's own suggestion, the 28th Battalion was established in 1940. The Maori considered themselves experienced warriors, and voluntary service in the battalion was a sort of proving of their military skills. During the Second World War, 28th Maori Battalion soldiers defended the borders of Greece and Crete. North Africa and Italy. They showed themselves to be brave warriors. By the number of decorations awarded during the war, the battalion had the upper hand compared to other New Zealand troops. And we've recovered uh, letters from prisoners of war uh, that were not sent home and in some of these letters they talk about the, the fear that the German had at facing uh, 28 Māori battalion on the firing line because their prowess as close combat fighters had preceded them to the degree that the Germans knew uh, when the Māori battalion was in the firing line in front of them. Stories of Māori soldiers and their bravery are also kept within families. Lawrence MacDonald's father fought with the 28th Maori Battalion. There were three of them together, and that were my father knew the one on the left was Bill, Bill Webb. Now Bill Webb got shot by a sniper, and my father stood up and shot the sniper. But when he shot the sniper, a, uh, a machine gun post was nearby and they severed his left arm below the elbow. So my father, um, my father before he fell over, he picked up the, the arm and threw it at the Germans. Today's commemoration in Rifton isn't just for soldiers from the battalion, but for all New Zealand soldiers who fell in past wars at home and abroad. Everyone present remembers the fallen soldiers with a minute's silence. But the Maori have their own traditions too. Participants exchange solemn speeches and sacral stones, a sign of reconciliation. The most touching moment is when all the guests rub noses, a traditional Maori greeting and they hug each other, forgiving all past wrongs. Yes. 
After the Second World War, New Zealand gained independence and joined the Commonwealth, but remains a self-sufficient nation. New Zealand is one of the wealthiest countries in the world. Its successful economy, based on tourism, agriculture and timber, is in harmony with a respectful attitude to nature. Tourists from all over the world come here to admire the beauty of New Zealand. Every coin has two sides. There was a time when Europeans destroyed Maori culture and took their lands and independence. But they also brought civilization. And today, the Maori also use the products of that civilization. The time of casting stones has gone. Now, it's time to gather them. The majority of the Maori tribes, the, the majority of the Maori people, have actually moved, moved on. The government issued apology, in fact the Queen issued a public apology to Māori for the way her uh, forebearers mistreated the native communities. And that began the healing process. You see, that's not part of our common, our, our, our language of today. Our language of today tells us that we must unite, we must work together. Genetics also support that. Scientists study data from modern Maori with unexpected results. 85% of Maori belong to Halo Group B4, which is typical of all Polynesians. But the remaining 15% were among Halo Groups typical of Caucasians. This can only mean one thing. Interethnic marriage slowly but surely mixed the blood of everybody living in New Zealand. But in saying that, I, I think another one should be for here, particularly in Aotearoa, you know, New Zealand is our country, everybody's one, so we should all learn everything together more than um, pick and choose which, which way we're going to be a New Zealander. You know, I'm going to be a cool white New Zealander, I'm going to be a Māori New Zealander. Where overall, in the next 50 years, all the Māori are going to sleep with all the Waka people and the white people are going to sleep with all the Māori and we're going to have everybody there looking like me. In 1769, James Cook arrived in New Zealand, and the time of Maori power in these lands came to an end. 200 years passed, and the hatchet has long been buried. The Maori and Europeans have come a long way together. They've learned to live together, two parts of one people, Kiwis, who can now never be divided.